Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're going to be repotting all of those cuttings that we gave away back in January um, with our annual fig cutting giveaway. We actually um, shared as many as 97 cuttings from close to a dozen different varieties of figs. And today we're going to be repotting them. For those of you that are interested in some fig cuttings for next year, here's my tip. Just send us an email to info at ivyorganics.com in that last week of January. And it's typically the day before or on February 1st. I'll just put it out there on YouTube for about 24 hours for those that um, you know fill in the rest of the spots. But um, again, in that last week of January only, not sooner, but that last week of January, if you send me an email to info at ivoryorganics.com with your request with any of the figs that you've seen on our YouTube channel. And so far, we've gathered about another half a dozen more, and I've got some more coming from Redlands and other parts of the country, in fact. And so those will all be part of the collection and made available to you um, just for our appreciation back to you for watching and supporting and encouraging um, the Ivory Organics YouTube channel. Um, what we're going to do today is we, I've got prepared here four tips that I want to make very clear and that's the reason I wrote it out to help make this process extremely successful to you which is repotting your cuttings that we started initially in a vermiculite and a perlite mix. I'm going to share the products with you in just a second and I'll share with you why we started with just these two items and not other products which I'll again review shortly. What we're also going to do is we're going to repot this now established fig tree it's been living in this um, container for about two years. This here is the, um, we've renamed it the Sheila Kadota fig. It's a Kadota fig that came from Sheila's property. Um, and the reason we named it as such is because, um, again, I didn't plant it, nor did I see the labels on it, you know, to confirm, in fact, this was a Kadota. But Sheila told me it was her Kadota tree. So that's the reason, for those of you that got this cutting, we named it the Sheila Kadota compared to the fig tree that I have here behind me, if you want to take a look at this real quick. Um, this here to my right is the Hilda Kadota fig tree, and this is a variety of fig that I've been enjoying in our family for about 30 years, um, enjoying delicious, extremely sweet, very pale pink um, flesh, um, extremely sweet like honey, and also you know the hint of berries and fruits. Um, a delicious variety of figs and again that's the reason it, it earned a spot in the ground on my property and not just living in a container um, so again we've called, renamed this the Hilda Kadota but what I've got here in front of me is take a look at all of these cuttings and a lot of you have asked the same question being um, you know I'm getting leaves or I'm getting roots or you know and, and that you're not getting both and, and so what I want to share with you is I've actually got similar uh, examples to share with you as well as you can take a look here and I can bring it or you can come here a little closer you can see that the container is loaded with roots this this cutting actually has more roots than any other cutting and this here is a raspberry latte is the um, flavor but I don't know if you can see all of these roots I should have used a cup that was a little bit more clear but that's the reason we go, we start off with a clear cup and you can see the roots are even coming out of the container and becoming um, girdled near the bottom and this is a problem when transplanting we're going to want to make sure we straighten all that without stressing out the plant if you take a look at the top there's not no evidence of growth if you take a look at these buds they haven't even swelled up there's no sign of green um, but again a lot of vigorous activity happening below the ground to the contrary this here is a more balanced um, result as you can see there's a lot of um, a large leaf there's some new leaf action coming out over here and now if we take a look at the root zone plenty of roots going all the way around um, but I haven't noticed that they're really um, circling near the bottom so um, the last example I want to share with you is one of these and this here is um, one of the black um, variety of figs and again I can see in fact here are some roots I think it was this one that I meant to share with you is as I spin it there are no roots in here at least no evidence of roots there may be some and you can see that it's growing but I would not recommend transplanting your figs until you have proof and evidence that there in fact are roots. Um, there are examples and as I just showed you 
where there could be some leafing happening, there could be some growth happening without the roots quite there. It's coming, but they may not be there. And I don't want you to stress it out any further by now moving it until there's a good solid amount of roots before transplanting it. But also don't wait so long that the roots become girdled and intertwined and that'll actually risk the health and compromise the life of the um, fig tree as those roots can eventually end up um, strangling and constricting itself, maybe not this year and maybe not next year, but over its lifetime, whether it be only a few years, maybe five years or 10 years, those roots will end up choking one another out if they end up in that girdled position. The goal with the roots is to make sure that they reach out and grow um, away from the center part of the tree. You don't want those roots to be in that spiral condition and that's the reason um, for making sure you start at an early stage and monitor it every, once we start this, maybe every six months to a year. While they're younger, I'm saying six months. Once they're more established, it could be a process you do every two to three years, maybe even every four years. But it's a process you're gonna continuously have to do is untangle, detangle those roots near the bottom, maybe do some light root pruning, um, balance the tree from up above whenever you prune the roots, um, and that'll maximize the health and, and the life and the quality of your fruits, because ultimately the goal is we wanna enjoy the best quality fruit that these figs can provide us with. So, point number one, when starting a cutting, and I wanna make sure I, I read this the way I'm gonna be writing it down below as well, begin with a non-organic, non-living material. So when I say non-organic, I'm not talking about using chemical man-made stuff, I'm talking about using a natural base but something that doesn't have um, living parts in it. For example, your kitchen scraps, your leaves and bark, and all of these things are derived from living organisms that break down through the process of decay. I wanna make sure that there aren't any things in your soil that will decay, but products that are natural are products such as these. Over here, you can see that I've got, for example, perlite, and perlite, if I can get my hands on a little bit of it over here, is as white as snow, it's a little wet, um, it somehow got some moisture in there, but um, it's very light, it's porous, the benefits of perlite is it helps prevent soil compaction, it promotes strong root development, and it's excellent for starting cuttings. The benefits of perlite is the benefits of perlite is that it will um, absorb water while at the same time it will allow water to pass, just like when you add sand or rocks to your soil mix to basically allow that water to pass through. The second product we use as well that is, I like calling it inorganic or a non, um, non-living non material is this, vermiculite. You can see it kind of looks like fool's gold, very fluffy and light. Again, the benefits, we can read the bag here. It says it improves moisture and nutrient retention, aids in faster seed germination, prevents soil compaction and increases aeration. So the goal is we want to make sure that we maximize with the air around the roots, and take a look at even the um, label over here. It says it's OMRI listed for organic use, and this one here, again, there's that OMRI seal. So it is organic products, but again, I'm hoping I made this very clear. They're not derived from living things. They're not derived from plant tissues. They're not derived from animal sources, animal newer. There's nothing derived from plant nor animal source um, within these products of vermiculite and perlite. So the reason for starting off with inorganic materials is to make sure that there aren't materials in it, the vermiculite and perlite, that there aren't organic living parts in there that will decay and lead to rot to these otherwise living tissues being the cuttings of the fig. For example, if I take this leaf off of a weed, there's a weed which I'll share with you shortly um, around this potted fig, but if I take this leaf, at this point, it's simply going to decay. At this point, if I plant it, it, there are some leaves that can germinate from planting, but chances are it's gonna, it's gonna begin to rot. The bacteria and the, um, the, the fungus and the, um, if there are any soil organisms, including earthworms and, um, and nematodes, they're gonna begin to um, eat and consume this living matter, and that's gonna be food for all of the living organisms within the soil. The reason I don't wanna have any products within the product that are going to decay is I don't want those cuttings to also begin to decay. It's one of the main reasons cuttings fail is due to decay and it's also the reason that it's important to consider using a rooting hormone or a rooting powder such as 
the rooting powders you can pick up on your shelf, or there's also um, a lot of successful um, cuttings that can be accomplished by dipping it in cinnamon. And the reason for using cinnamon is because it's anti-rot, it's anti-decay. And the other product is also honey. Honey, you can put it in your um, cabinet. You can you know, typically leave it out of the refrigerator. I think it's even recommended to keep it on, on a shelf. And when it comes to honey, honey is also naturally antimicrobial, antifungal, anti all of these things. And it's that benefit, more so than the ability to encourage roots, is the ability that it prevents against rot and, 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 and disease from happening within those cuttings. So now we just did a quick lesson on that and we talked about the importance of starting off with the inorganic. But now that we're gonna graduate these cuttings to the next size container, I brought with me um, I brought with me these other products. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make a one-third, one-third, one-third vermiculite, perlite, and then peat moss mix. And what we're gonna do is the peat moss is now derived from peat, but the more responsible, environmentally better decision to use aside from peat moss is using coconut core. And I'll actually put the spelling right here right now for you. But coconut core and there's um, pretty much all the nurseries across the country now make it available. I happen to have peat moss um, still in my um, reserves, so I'm sharing that with you. I'm gonna continue using that, but once this is gone, consider using um, coconut core as it's more readily available. And the reason is, is because the, um, the bogs where this moss is harvested, it takes decades and centuries for it to um, exist, and it's being harvested at a rate much faster than it can be recreated. And so that's the reason to consider going with coconut core over using sphagnum peat moss. Um, but today we're gonna to use sphagnum peat moss. And then the third product I wanna share with you is this over here. Um, I brought with me this product from the Laguna Hills Nursery. And this is a product made by the owner, Gary Matsuoka, who um, created Gary's Best Top Pot. He describes the soil as being what's, um, what he calls a permanent soil. Um, a lot of the products, and I'm not talking about these, but a lot of the potting soil mixes that you see on your, um, in your local nurseries have a lot of organic material, things that are derived from living organisms. And as you know, when you start off with your compost pile, whether it be from kitchen scraps or leaves or whatever else, it all disintegrates, it all breaks down. Um, and eventually, once you have a bag, even of this <coughs> um, sphagnum peat moss, it'll eventually break down um, and leave air pockets or if it doesn't leave air pockets what's going to happen is your plant's going to collapse and that's the reason he uses the word permanent soil because the point is once you pot your plant you want to make sure it stays where you put it the issue for example is this fig that i've been using other potting mixes if you come in a little closer you'll see what the issue is over here um here's that weed that i told you about we can pick it out right now um but if you take a look around the fig, you can see that there's all of these exposed roots. Well, it wasn't like that when I first planted it. You can see right here is another root, another root. Um, there's just roots all around. The um, When I planted it, I made sure that all of the roots, these surface roots were covered, but you don't also want to plant it too deep as well as basically a lot, a lot of the air roots and roots that um, absorb those minerals and nutrients necessary for the um, fig's health. Um, most of them are in that top foot, but Again, because it's got so much organic material in a lot of these other potting mixes that exist on your nursery store shelf, um, you gotta monitor this and you can imagine that basically the entire root ball within it, as these organics break down, are getting compressed. And that's an issue for the health and the life of your plants and trees. Um, and that's why we're going with Gary's Best and I'm also gonna put their address real quick down below here for the Laguna Hills Nursery where I picked that up. I know there's other stores that also stock it, um, but I'm proud to share that the Laguna Hills Nursery also carries the Ivy Organics products, which we're gonna discuss towards the end. Um, but you can pretty much get the Gary's Best products as well as the Ivy Organics products into any nursery in the country by contacting one of two different distributors, one being l l Nursery and the other one is Central Garden Centers. These two distributors can pretty much get your products into any nursery in the entire country. And every single nursery pretty much buys their supplies and their stock from, again, l l or Central Garden. So um, consider reaching out to your local nursery rep, um, the person you work with, and have them get Gary's Best Top Pot soils. And there's a whole line of, of soil products um, that they can use. 
as well as the Ivory Organics products, which I'm going to share with you the benefits and how that's going to help you when transplanting your plants, whether it goes into another pot or into the ground. So we now talked about when starting a cutting, cutting begin with non-organic vermiculite and perlite. And now we're going to um, basically graduate it and create now um, a product and a soil mix that has some organics in it. So let's do that right now. So here we are with Gary's Best. I want to um, show you what the product looks like. I want to show you what the product ingredients are so you can compare it to your other potty mixes wherever you guys are in the country and around the world. Um, let's take a look at it. If you come in a little closer, take a look. Here's Gary's Best top pot. Let's take a look at the product. If you come in a little closer, I'm putting it here in the light. You can see what it looks like. Um, and now let's see what the ingredients are if we turn this around. So ingredients are peat moss, pumice, perlite, sand, and charcoal. And he basically has that mix and percentages of each to make sure that that soil doesn't collapse. Um, as you can see that there's some sphagnum moss or, or peat moss within the product. And that's basically to add, um, you know, the ability for it to absorb water. It's adding some organic materials to it. But again, the percentages of the organics in this compared to the other products are a lot less therefore the soil won't collapse it won't cause those roots to collapse and it won't cause that entire root area near the surface to become exposed and this is a, a, a phenomenon that's happening pretty much every six to twelve months so the goal is hopefully you're going to end up doing this once and be done for at least a year if not two uh, by using a more permanent soil such as this product but assuming you don't have it let's go and make our own product now at home what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the vermiculite and I'm just going to create a mix like this. And the goal is to put about one third of each of these products. clearly doing this for demonstration purposes. Typically I would have this in a container and I would um, mix it within a container. But I wanted you to see the colors, I wanted you to get familiar with the textures, I wanted you to see what it is that I was doing. Um, and the next step is, I've even got some potty mix from last time that I reused in this container. So I'm just going to put that down there as well. I can re recirculate that and since I've got Gary's Best Soil, let's put a little bit of that in there too. And basically make a really good mix. So let me reiterate the importance of making sure that once you prepare the soil for your cuttings, we're now doing something that's a combination of inorganic plus organic. And again, this is only for your pottings. If you're going to repot your plant, um, that you're going to be using this formula. When it comes to your in-ground plantings, there's different soils. It will not be this. It will not be this these products. And um, Unfortunately, I'm going to be doing those lessons in about a month. So you're going to have to hang tight for those of you um, that are planning on taking your cuttings and sticking them right in the ground. I have some videos you can take a look at from the past, but there's lessons I've learned in the last six months that have pretty much transformed the way I now plant my trees. So you're going to have to make sure you stay subscribed and I'll make sure in the upcoming weeks, again, I anticipate within a month, we'll be planting not just figs, but a whole bunch of other trees in a completely different way than was ever taught before. Um, so with that being said, let's continue. The next major decision you're gonna have to um, come across, and a lot of you have asked me this question is, what size container do I go with my cuttings that started off in a little cup to, can I put it in a three to five gallon container, you know, or should I put it in a 15 gallon container? Or, you know, do I graduate to a one gallon container? Um, what do I do? Which container size do I use? And there is an answer for this. And it is, you're supposed to graduate your fig into a container where within about a month, those roots should be able to reach into all spans of the container. If the roots don't get into the soil medium, for example, if we start off with, um, you know, a three to five gallon size container, if we put our little figling right up here, the chances are within a month, those roots are not going to make it down to the bottom. And 
the risk is now you're gonna end up with all of this soil that'll begin to rot because it's sitting there wet and it's not in contact with the living roots that'll basically be circulating the minerals and the water and, the, and, and, and basically bringing life to that soil. Um, and that again leads to rot and the rot could re result in creating a lot of disease, whether they be, um, you know, um, we always talk about beneficial bacteria, but there's also bacteria that can lead to root rot and phytophthora, which is another um, fungal, um, related to fungal family, that can lead to um, root rot and a whole bunch of other disease. A lot of bad things can happen again if you've got soil that's sitting in there that's not being used and not in contact with the roots. So the answer is make sure you start off with a smaller container and if your goal is to graduate into a 15 size container is to start off with a small container, maybe one gallon, graduate that to a three to a five and from there from a you know into a 15 and a 20. Um, so basically graduate it and the goal is hopefully you're graduating your figs over the course of maybe once every six months. Um, it should not be more frequent than that once you basically get out of this container. And the other consideration as well is to make sure you time it with the end of winter and after your last chance to frost has passed is a really good window to then transplant it right after your last chance to frost and before the fig wakes up and pushes out that new growth. So I'm a little bit too late, but I know a lot of parts of the central and eastern parts of this country are still really cold so your figs probably still haven't um you know woke you know um started its growth yet so i'm hoping with this lesson that for those of you that have figs in containers that you consider repotting them now um again assuming your last chance to frost is passed but before it pushes out that new growth because now there's a new stress that's going to be introduced to um, your potted figs that otherwise wouldn't exist had those leaves not pushed out yet so let's now blend our um, soil mix. And what we're going to do here now is we're going to, I'm going to um, select to use this ceramic clay pot and I enjoy using a saucer as well and I want to point out that with my saucer what I've done and I've done a whole lesson on this as well is I basically glued on some marbles at the base and the reason is when you put this on your um, patio or on your wooden decks, especially if they're wooden decks, you wouldn't want the wet saucer basically um, keeping that area too moist for too long and thereby causing um, one stain to your patio or rot, wood rot to your deck. So this here basically allows the water to pass underneath and dry quickly compared to retaining and trapping moisture. So again, I've got these um, glued on marbles and we'll set that down here. The next step is I'm going to take some rocks, which I've got over here, and put these near the base to basically block. And you got to make sure that this is another important lesson. You got to make sure that there's a hole inside your container because you're going to want to make sure that water passes. If it doesn't have a hole, you're going to have to add some more drain holes to make sure that when you water, that water passes and comes through. So now we're just going to add some rocks near the base. And I've just added about an inch or two of rocks. And now we can go with our potty mix. So now we're gonna take our fig. This part is gonna be important. And by the way, this one here is my tiger fig, also known as the panache fig. I like calling it my variegated fig because I can tell even on the stems, if you come in a little closer, it's, it caught my eye and that's why I wanted to point this out as well. You can see the stripes between like, it's got a little bit of a yellowish bark and a little bit of green stripes going in there and a little bit of brown. Uh, but the coolest part is when it fruits, I'm going to share with you my five on one fig in just a second because that's just starting to wake up as well. Um, but it's going to have um, green figs with white stripes on it. And, um, and let's get this started. Here we go. When removing it from the container, make sure you're very gentle. Continuously push on the bottom to get um, the roots loose and out of those joints that may be at the bottom of the container. But here it is. It's sliding right out. And now let's examine the root flow. And you can see that those roots are a little bit, you know, pressed against the side, but there's no coiling happening near the bottom. I'm not going to disrupt the roots, but if there was a lot of coiling, I might have to pull some of those roots and open them out and basically flare them out so that it goes into the container, um, you know, out towards the container walls rather than in continuous, you know, continuing that circling pattern. But this is a wonderful time for us to now take this cutting 
and turn it into a larger plant. So here we are repotting it. We're going to make sure that the level that it was in the small cup is at that same level within the pot. So I'm gonna to have to add a little bit more potting mix. I wanna get that up a little higher. Right there. And then I'm gonna also wanna keep a little bit of a rim so I can also water around it as well. We're gonna add a little bit of pressure around the roots to make sure that those roots are in contact with soil and not air so it doesn't dry out if it was in contact with air. And again, we're gonna make sure that we're at that same line. I'm being real careful about this and then compressing the rest of this down. And the last step is to water. When watering your container plants, make sure you soak them. So as you can see, I left a good half an inch or so to basically hold that water between my watering. So here, once it drinks the water, we can add some more. And then the reason for the saucer, as you can see, it's capturing the water. A lot of people will say, do not use a saucer as the saucer will basically, again, lead to rot and the soil is gonna get too damp and whatever else. But as the gardener, you're gonna have to water your plants and watch them. I like leaving the saucer because if I were to fertilize, and that leads me to my next point, do not fertilize your plants when repotting them. The reason is, and this is, I believe, my point number three, is do not fertilize your plants for at least one to three weeks. What, and the reason is this, no matter what you do to your plants, whether it's pruning or transplanting or fertilizing or simply moving the plant from one corner of your house to another corner of your house, for example, you may have heard that story about that ficus plant that you moved from one window to the next window um, or moved it from one corner of your office to another corner of the office and all of a sudden the plant drops all of its leaves. The same, same thing happens with other plants and other parts of your garden and even if they don't show signs of stress, it's a stress. It, just moving a plant from one corner of your property to another corner of your property is a different microclimate, different amounts of light, different amounts of shade, different parts of the plant are exposed to sun. Just simply by turning the plant around, you're exposing it to different amounts of light on different surfaces of the plant. So no matter what you do to your plant, that's a stress. So the reason for not fertilizing your plant for at least one to three weeks is to make sure that you do not add another stress on top of the stress of we just moved it from this container to that container. So I hope that makes sense. Do things in steps, take your time, don't do all of these things to your plants all at once and that'll be of value. Um, what we're gonna do next, and as you can see, the saucer is now full of water. I like leaving the plant to soak for, and especially on this first day, for the whole day. If there's still a lot of water in this container by tomorrow, I'll empty the saucer out and allow it to dry. When it comes to watering your plants in that first um, month, make sure that it gets water, I would say on average, two to three times per week. But once established, let's say after that first month, then you're gonna water your plants just based on the weather. Come um, spring and fall, being that they're typically more mild um, seasons, you'll probably end up watering your fig on average once a week. Um, in the winter, possibly nothing to maybe just once a month, let's say at least once a month, because even um, my clients that I follow in New York, New Jersey, they bring in their, their figs into the garage, um, but they still water their figs once a month because they will dry out um, even in a cold climate as well, so, and with no water. So you gotta make sure that they do get water at least once a month during the winter months. And then the summer, you stay, still may need to water your figs two to three times a week, depending on how severe your heat is. So again, you're gonna have to watch your soil and, and basically you know run tests, and we have a whole video that talks about all of that. Um, and I'm not gonna get into that right here. So again, gauge your watering based on what's happening in your climate, check the soil, make sure that um, the soil remains um, moist, but never bone dry. Um, and again, the goal is when you do water, make sure you soak it. And that's the reason for the saucer. I wanna make sure that that soil continuously drinks the water, at least for a day, but I'm not gonna allow that soil to rot by it continuously sitting in that water all day long. And now for the last step. So step four. Are your plants protected? And now it's time to use Ivy Organics. And let me explain to you how, and I've got here this brochure before I explain the products to you. If you take a look here, 
Here's a brochure that talks about are your plants protected? Protection against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents for uses on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs as a non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic product. And the way this product's gonna work is, and basically this brochure is basically our um, pop-up banners that you'll find at any of the conventions and expos that we attend, where the first banner reads sunblock protection, and it does so by um, preventing sunburn and we're talking about summer sunburn when i write sun scald that's winter sun scald it offers insulation from the extremes of winter freezing premature blooms to basically keep the plant insulated and not um, tricked into a false spring bloom due to um, too much heat on that bark surface so it also functions as protection against um, premature blooms it functions also as an anti-transparent that's what we're gonna be using it for today right now is to basically minimize that sun stress on the leaves and on the um, trunk and branches of the um, fig. And also applicable for prune trees and plants. As we take a look at the more established fig in the fig container, um, we're gonna be using it also for um, coating all of the prune surfaces as we've been pruning it down to size. We're going to be discussing that as well shortly. And then as an insect repellent, and talk about insect, look what we've got over here. That's just crazy. Um, as an insect repellent, our product does not kill insects, by the way. Um, the product works as a repellent against insects and as a repellent against rodents. For prune trees, damaged bark, bulbs, time release, and against rodents, <laughs> excuse me. And as a rodent repellent against girdling trees, bulbs, as a time release, and for new and established trees and shrubs and vegetables. So let's get started. So what we're going to do now is if you come in a little closer, you'll take a look here. This here is um, one of our more popular products is the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Protection Against Damaging. We already read it. Sunburn insects and rodents. Register material for use in organic agriculture. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pre and damaged surfaces. Color white. The product's also available in colors brown and green, but this one here that I'm holding is a blue label, and the blue label reads whitewash rather than protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents. So the whitewash formula says protection against damaging summer sunburn and winter sun scald. The difference between these two products is the yellow label has seven natural garden oils compared to the blue label that basically is oil free. Um, the seven oils that you'll find in the yellow product is organic castor oil, cinnamon, cloves, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. Um, whereas with this product, there's no oil, but we still have added the benefits of garlic and cinnamon powder. The goal again with the blue label is to offer protection against from the extremes of sun. Both of these products can be used, um, whether it's a whitewash formula or a three-in-one product, as all of these three things. And I want you guys to be familiar that the product can be used as a brush on by simply adding water to the top of this can, as a foliar spray by taking one to two teaspoons, or actually it says by adding one to two teaspoons per gallon of water, you can um, basically take the brush on solution Take one or two teaspoons per gallon and make the foliar spray, or as a tree paste direction, um, adding a quarter cup of water, you'll end up with about a third of a can, a fourth of a can, a product that you can apply to basically fill in any, um, any large wounds, which, um, for example, if you come in a little closer, a tree paste would work really well in a gash like this that's um, on the top of this particular um, fig cutting. So I'm hoping you can capture that. Let me get some of that shade out of the way. So you can see there's a nice, I don't want to say nice, but there's a line right there that could benefit from being used as a tree paste, but I'm actually just going to be using the brush on um, and doing a few applications and trying to fill it in that way. When we get to there, and that'll be next. But what we're going to do right now is I've got this can ready to use. This is the protection um, with color green, and I just want to show you how this works. Um, being that this plant is so small, this may not be the best way to brush it on, but I want to show you guys what it looks like if I were to protect the surface of the plant against that summer sunburn. And again, in the winter, it offers the protection against winter sun scald. So we can coat it like so. I'm doing actually a pretty good job here. And you're gonna wanna go all the way down to the soil surface and go up as high as is not protected. So all of the bark is now covered as if we just put on a nice light t-shirt onto this little Figling. Um, what we're also going to do 
And again, I could do this with colors green, brown, or white, is create a foliar spray. This one here is a ready to use foliar spray. We're just gonna shake it here. Take a look at it again. It's the Ivory Organics ready to use spray. But what I'm gonna do with this is I can just spray the leaves now. And now we've got a nice light white sunblock there to help reflect. And again, we read anti-transparent being, we don't want the plant leaf, this entire surface, to basically lose too much water with all of the stresses that have happened to the root. If there's an imbalance between the roots and the upper part of the plant, the plant could end up shriveling and dying or getting even more stressed out even if it does live. But the goal is by spraying it, it's now gonna be a cooler plant. Um, hence the reason when I started Regrow Cool Plants, um, this is the coolness that we're offering the plant so that it doesn't stress um, even on a beautiful day like today that's gonna be in the low 80s. Um, that could be too much sun stress being it's gonna be out in the sun not for 12 hours as the equinox is behind us, as spring equinox, but now there's more light hours per day, more than 12 hours per day, working its way towards 13 and 14 hours a day. That's a lot, a lot of light on the plant, especially a brand new plant, to not offer that whitewash protection that you're gonna get from the Ivory Organics product. I hope you found this um, video informative and educational, and if so, be sure to like it. Most importantly, by subscribing down below, you'll be connected to this and all of our other, all of our other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching, and happy gardening.